Welcome, everyone. My name is Joan Fitzgerald. I'm the interim dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs here at Northeastern. And uh, I'd like to thank Rebecca again for this conference. The social innovation, the social impact is very important to the work we do at the policy school. And uh, the new social impact lab is a real jewel in our crown. Um, I'd also like to mention that with everything we do to have impact, we also want to integrate that into our education mission. So right now we are going through an approval process to, de uh, to develop a graduate certificate in nonprofit management, philo philanthropy, and social change. And we're really excited uh, about that orientation that we see exhibited in this conference today. The title of our session is Rethinking Urban Space, District-Level Problem Solving. So you heard it here first, district-level sustainability is going to be the next big thing for cities in climate change and sustainability planning. So you might ask, what is district-level sustainability? Uh, in September, I was approached by the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities and the Urban Sustainability Developers Network, uh, an organization over 100 urban sustainability officers, to conduct a, stand, a scan of something called district-level sustainability. And the idea is that many cities have developed very good climate action plans with goals, benchmarks, maybe some cities call them sustainability plans. And when you look at them, they set goals for the whole city. But it's kind of hard to move at the city level. What does that mean to change how you think about stormwater management or renewable energy? But yet many of the things that cities do are at the building level, such as requirements that buildings, new buildings meet certain standards on energy efficiency or use of renewable energy or water use. And it's kind of the city level is too big to think about planning, and at the building level, you're moving very slowly. So for many in the foundation world, in cities, and in community organizations, they're looking at the level of the district or perhaps the neighborhood as kind of that sweet spot of how you can really move the agenda forward and think about experimentation, testing new strategies, testing new technologies, that then can be applied to the rest, of the, the rest of the city. So asking to conduct this scan, the reason I was asked is I've spent a lot of time examining these called eco-districts in European cities. And they're just amazing in terms of how they incorporate renewable energy, energy efficiency, the best in stormwater management. But in many cases, they're islands of affluence. They're developed and they, they become upper, upper middle class neighborhoods and don't really allow for anyone else. So the Funders Network said sustainability, environment, equity, and, and economic development. And can we incorporate those? And are cities doing it? So in doing this scan, one of the things I found out is many cities throughout the country are doing various models of district-level sustainability. Eco-districts is one of those models and one that I think has a lot of promise, but there's other ways to go about it. And I found in some cities there may be multiple projects going on and some people have no idea. City government doesn't know what community organizations are doing on district level sustainability or maybe there isn't much of a foundation presence. But in some cities there was a real integration and two of them that stood out in my skin were Seattle and Boston. So I'm proud to be able to say that my home city was one of, one of the leaders in this. But let me just talk about a couple of examples. In Seattle you have a foundation, the Bullet Foundation, um, that just built this absolutely amazing zero net energy building. And they thought about it and said, gee, this is great that we're doing something at the building level, but how do we expand that into our own neighborhood and create this kind of 
zero net energy environment. And they're working with a community housing, affordable housing organization to create, that's already been created, the Capitol Hill Eco District that's working in a neighborhood to integrate principles of smart growth, transit-oriented development. But also, the city is working with another approach to district-level sustainability called 2030 Districts. And this came out of an organization called Architecture 2030. And what they're doing is they take an area of the city, it's almost the whole downtown of Seattle, engaging the private sector into buying into and committing to very ambitious goals around reducing water usage, developing stormwater management, energy efficiency, and even reducing their transportation footprint. So very innovative. Um, and it's having an impact in how the city thinks about future rounds of regulation and its own climate plan. So I'm pleased to say we have a similar thing going on in Boston, where we have a foundation, we have city government, and we have community organizations all committed to achieving the triple E bottom line in neighborhoods throughout Boston. So how we're going to proceed is we're going to start with Mariella Puerto, who is a senior program officer at the Barr Foundation. John Dalzell, who is a senior architect around sustainability issues at the Boston Redevelopment Authority. And Dave Quigley, who is an eco-innovation fellow at Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. And what I've asked them to do is to tell us how this all came about. Why are we doing such a good job in Boston? Is this something that the city thought of, the foundation world thought of, and everyone bought into it? So they're each going to talk for about five minutes to tell their story of how it occurred, and then I'll follow up with some questions before turning it over to the audience. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So let me tell you where I'm coming from and where the foundation where I work at uh, is coming from. Um, the Bar Foundation is guided by a vision for a vibrant, just, and sustainable world with hopeful futures for children. Five years ago, um, we made the decision to shift all our environmental grant making to focus on climate change because we felt that it is the defining issue of our time. Um, we were concerned that our children and grandchildren would inherit from us a world beset by um, rising sea level, catastrophic um, um, weather patterns, catastrophic weather patterns, uh, and a variety of other um, issues that would beset us. Um, you know, we, when we talk about some of the issues we were talking about earlier today, about health, social impacts. Climate change is going to have severe impacts on all those issues. Um, so we felt that it was, it was such a defining issue that we should shift our environmental grant making to address climate change. So we did a scan of uh, where we should focus our efforts. Um, we looked nationally, and at that time, uh, Copenhagen talks were going on, and the Wexman Markey Bill was being debated in Congress. Uh, we actually decided not to engage at the international or national level because we felt that over the years we had built up significant um, networks, capacity, um, and um, you know the the ability to work locally, uh, and we felt that we could have the most impact and make tr more contributions at the local level. So we set a goal to help Boston and Massachusetts meet or exceed. It's 2020 and 2050 greenhouse gas emission goals. We chose to focus locally because we saw the potential for Boston and Massachusetts to demonstrate the art of the possible, to show that local communities could take action on climate change. It's not an abstract concept around pol politics and policy at the state level, I mean at the national level. It's about how we, all of us collectively, can change our behavior and engage in actions 
that reduce emissions in our communities. So we've been supporting efforts that accelerate energy efficiency, clean energy, as well as uh, getting people out of their cars, reducing vehicle miles traveled. But this was five years ago. Before that, for about a decade, we had been supporting sustainability efforts in Boston. Uh, we worked with the city uh, on developing the Boston Nature Center, which was the first green building in the city. And then we moved on beyond that to think about what can we do to change systems and systematically have an impact on the rest of Boston. So we, just, we don't just have one one-off project at the Boston Nature Center. Uh, so one of the questions that I posed to some of the champions within City Hall um, around sustainability was, what can we do to accelerate green building practices throughout the city? Um, and fortunately, we had some people in the energy office uh, who were really um, interested in taking this on. And there were some people at the Boston Redevelopment Authority who were also interested. And what we did was we, uh, we approached Mayor Menino and asked him if he was interested in convening a task force, a multi-stakeholder task force to look at what Boston could do in terms of policies. Uh, to make a long story short, the task force met for one year and came up with a set of recommendations. Um, and uh, Boston was the first city in the country to promulgate regulations uh, requiring that all major buildings, 50,000 square feet and above, uh, have to build to the LEED um, certifi certification. So that was a decade ago, and this is really about a long-term relationship with many people at City Hall, with Mayor Menino. Um, and it was really quite um, easy for us to then step into the next stage, moving from green building policy to what can we do even more. And I think the role of philanthropy is that we can keep pushing the envelope, always asking the, quest the, the questions around, yes, we have, you know, we've done something, uh, we've achieved something, we've put some policies in place, we've changed some practices, but always looking ahead, looking over the horizon and asking what more can we be doing. We have almost the luxury of being able to do that. Um, so when, when you ask how did this Eco Districts uh, movement come about, uh, it was really very organic. Um, and it was really about us looking ahead and seeing, all right, we, we have green building practices which deal with the individual building. We can make a building as green as possible, you know, less energy use. Uh, we can put some solar panels on it. Uh, we can have some nice storm water management around the building with um, um, you know, nice landscaping. Um, but that's just one building, right? Um, so the district level brings it out beyond one building to maybe a neighborhood level or maybe to a few streets, uh, several streets uh, in, a, in a community. Um, and we felt that that was the next step because you can achieve many more efficiencies and have greater impact in terms of renewable energy um, and also be, you know, getting the community together to do different things uh, at the district level. So we actually uh, worked with the Boston Redevelopment Authority and City Hall um, to see what we could do together. Now, let me tell you, this is, you know, truthfully, it wasn't an easy conversation to have. Um, I did approach some people at City Hall, and they were saying to me, what, what is this the eco-district thing? You know, we have our hands full on all the policies that we have. We've got a climate plan we need to implement. Don't bother us with these new ideas. You know, you, you're in your ivory tower. I mean, they, they didn't say that so blatantly, but I did get the, uh, the cold shoulder several times. Several meetings uh, with um, some key people in administration, and they said, mm, you know, no, nah, we, we will wait, we will wait. Um, but then there came an opportunity where I heard about um, an organization in Portland, Oregon, and it's actually called Eco Districts. They actually branded the term and made an organization out of it. And they were doing some Eco District planning in Portland. Um, and they uh, decided to organize a summit and invite 
city leaders and business leaders from different cities around the country. When I heard about it, I thought, huh, this is a great opportunity for Boston to learn from what Portland is doing and what other communities are doing. Um, so I approached um, my friends again at the city and I said, look, you know, I'm willing to pay for your travel. I know there's a, uh, there's a ban on travel right now. Uh, you, you don't want to look like it's, uh, it's a junkard. Uh, but we'll be willing to pay for the trip uh, and the conference expenses. And they actually um, decided to go. And I think that's how the seed was planted. They came back and thought that perhaps Boston could be a place where the eco districts concept could be piloted. And yeah, I'm sure John has more stories to tell. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mary Ellen. Good morning, everyone. I am John Delzell with the Boston Redevelopment Authority, and I'm uh, one of Mary Ellen's secret moles inside of city government. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, right? Um, Mary Ellen is, is truly modest, uh, but also quite visionary and quite tenacious, as you can imagine. Our, our story uh, working together really does go back 10 years to the Boston Nature Center and to the Mayor's Green Building Task Force, which I had the, the good fortune of leading from the, the city's uh, uh, side of, of staffing things. That's the, you know, there's leadership and then there's the people who do all the work. I fall into the latter category. Um, but it is a, a, a truly incremental story, and it is really one of being tenacious and um, visionary. And so we, we have had this long partnership with Bar Foundation and Mario, and really did pioneer some amazing things. The, the city zoning that requires green building outcomes was a remarkable regulatory feat. I, I look back, and, and I'm still amazed at how smoothly it went. Um, I'm greatly comforted by how it's been replicated throughout the country. Most of the big cities uh, that share our regulatory framework, state building code, local zoning code, things like that, um, have modeled our, our regulations literally in words. I can find paragraphs of things I wrote in Boston and San Francisco and Los Angeles and other cities around the country, which is good. You know, no point in reinventing stuff. Um, and we, we actually have been looking beyond buildings for a little bit now. One of the clever things we were able to do in capturing the U.S. Green Building Council's lead rating systems in our zoning is we were able to include lead for neighborhood development. Which, was a, which is an early effort to look beyond the building scale solution. It is not really quite district scale. It's a, a delightful in-between space. Um, and it's not exactly a municipal tool. It, it has been something we've deployed in a few different ways. We've been uh, very flexible in our utilization of it, but it, it's really for shaping development projects. And Boston was fortunate enough to have two lead for neighborhood development pilot programs or pilot projects, the Jackson Square development uh, in, in Jamaica Plain and Bartlett Yard in, in Roxbury. But we've also had uh, larger development projects which by zoning have to comply with lead for neighborhood development. That includes things like Seaport Square in the Innovation District, a little old six million square foot development project. Um, and it's been very instrumental in, in helping us move beyond the buildings. And there's a neat thing that happens when you do that, which is as soon as you stop talking about the buildings, the discussion and the debate about building practices goes away. So it's a great way to get past that little battle. And say, we're not doing, just do the building. You know, you gotta do that. We're talking about how your buildings work together now. So very helpful in the regulatory space. Um, going forward though, and I'll leave some room for stories later on. Um, We've committed to piloting two eco-districts in the city. One is in the Innovation District or the Seaport District, and it's up here behind me. And you can see it. It's a pretty large area, somewhere of, uh, I don't know, we, we probably got about 40 million square feet going in there. About half of it's been built. So it's a remarkable space in terms of it being in dynamic change. We have big players there. They're complicated. They're not necessarily long-term owners, so they have a different perspective on things. But they're change agents, so we can shape things to uh, a remarkable end by looking at what's being planned. The other district is really one that actually came to us, and I'm going to leave that to Dave to talk about, but it's the 
uh, Talbot Norfolk Triangle Eco Innovation District. And while today I've probably got uh, a few thousand units of housing going up in the Innovation District, in uh, Dave's Eco District we have about 500 units of housing. So there's a dramatic scale. Um, there's there's a, a community aspect that's really beautiful in the TNT area. And, and a very different corporate developer personality in the innovation district downtown. Um, and it's, it's probably nationally the two ends of the spectrum, frankly, that we're seeing around eco districts around the country. Um, we've also, uh, and this is with Mary Ellis' help, uh, brought in an eco district energy fellow uh, into the BRA, someone who's uh, specifically purpose to helping us advance this work but also helping us to look at the energy opportunities within an eco district. And frankly, for areas like downtown cities, uh, a lot of the conversation is going to hone in on energy strategies that address things like climate change and uh, our continuing work around greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, and that's a good thing, but it's not the only thing. I don't want to overly dwell on that. Uh, for us, this will be a remarkable opportunity to address climate change preparedness. It's, uh, it's really an all-in moment. Uh, the, the team behind our front is really the Energy and Environment Office and the BRA, the city's planning and, and development agency, but it's also our transportation agency. It's our parks department. It's, it's virtually everybody who's got some opportunity to work collaboratively um, in this space. And it's uh, very much about organization and leadership. We're really fortunate um, in Dave's neighborhood because they've actually been organizing and they've come together and they actually have a vision and a plan and they have committees and they're, they're really uh, a, a robust group. Um, and they have leadership and that's real important for us. Um, this one really will be a story, I think, of uh, stakeholders working in collaboration and looking for shared solutions. And in this, I think it's important, the stakeholders and the partnership part of this is very much going to include the city and the state. Um, and that's the scale where I think we can get lots and lots of uh, really important work done. I think the key to us going forward, and really the key to eco districts around the country, is going to be about working together. And just to go back to the story for a moment, we started with a lovely building, which you should go see. It's the, the Nature Center at the Boston uh, Audubon uh, site in Mattapan. It's a, a beautiful, fabulous building to spend some time in or bring kids to. But we started with one really remarkable building. And we've grown that to where there's, uh, uh, I don't know, 40 million square feet of LEED certified buildings in the city. Um, we've, we've uh, last Wednesday, we awarded LEED Platinum to our first four energy positive green buildings. So these are homes that are contributing electricity back to the grid. We've got another two soon to get their LEED Platinum Awards as well. And we've got another 44 in planning. So a constant story of scaling up across a lot of practice areas. And so I think as we go forward, this theme of working together, scaling up practices, that's going to be what this is going to be all about. And it's not going to be just energy. It is going to look at equity. Um, that's a real important thing in the neighborhoods, but it's really important in the downtown area too. The opportunity to address inequities um, in, in economics and in, in lifetime opportunities. Um, there's, there's a lot of horsepower downtown in the innovation district, and we, we can't lose sight of that. We want to be very fine grain, fine grain as we work in areas like TNT. But we've, we've got this beautiful lab, if you will, to look at these, these two spectrums. So it's a very exciting moment, and it's an it's, it's especially remarkable moment for the partnership that I have the good fortune of sitting amongst here. Thanks, John. Um, can everyone hear me? It's just working up. There we go. Uh, I'm Dave Creeley. I'm the Eco Innovation Fellow at the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. Um, one of the things that struck me uh, between what Mariella said and what John said, I was actually the first director at the Boston Nature Center. And um, um, one of the things that struck me was, don't worry, <laughs> uh, the theme was that it was a building that teaches. And what we're really talking about here is a neighborhood that teaches. So um, what we're doing over in Codman Square with the Eco Innovation District um, with the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation is the following. Um, CSNDC's mission 
is really to focus on creating affordable rental um, home ownership and commercial opportunities in Dorchester. Um, right now we have about 1,700 units of housing. We've gone as high as over 2,000 units of housing. Um, the effort that I'm working on really started about 2009 um, through an effort called Millennium Tenant, which uh, Common Square led a neighborhood-wide planning effort involving over 1,000 people and really tried to find out what it was that people wanted to see happen in their neighborhood in the next 10 years. So one of the things that popped up, um, and we partnered with Boston Lisk on this effort, um, one of the things that popped up was sustainability and green space and um, <clears throat> affordability was another issue as well. So what that led us to do was take a look at LEED ND. Uh, John mentioned uh, LEED ND is the U US Green Building Council's uh, rating system for neighborhoods. So we actually tried to apply LEED ND in a way that it really hadn't been applied before. Um, LEED ND is really meant to be applied to um, projects like Jackson Square where you have a development next to transit that also happens to have a lot of walkability uh, given that there are stores nearby. What we're talking about in the Talbot Norfolk Triangle area is a 13 block area, 250 homes, it's pretty much residential, 525 housing units. So we realized that in the course of looking at what would, how would we score in LEED ND, we could get to a LEED ND silver rating, which is pretty good. Um, part of my job is to try to push that forward uh, or higher. Um, <clears throat> so in the course of doing that, we said, well, let's talk to somebody about funding. And we talked to uh, Mariella about funding uh, my position. So that's really led to this um, three-year effort to try to create an eco-innovation district. Um, in the Talbot Norfolk Triangle area. John alluded to the fact there's a, that there's a, a neighborhood group there that we're working with. They've been organized for quite some time. Um, I worked with them back in 2009 on transforming a vacant lot into a playground. And that, I think, really kind of galvanized people to realize what the possibilities were for not just open space, but for what else could happen in the neighborhoods. So that really, I think, got people percolating on what else could be done. So right now, we're in year one of this effort. Um, we have different working groups or subcommittees up and running. There's one that's focused on um, retro getting people to retrofit their homes, so taking advantage of how to save money using existing programs like that that ABCD offers if you're income qualified, or other kinds of low interest loan programs where you can get your homes insulated for free or low cost and save money on your energy bill. So that's one thing we're looking at. Um, another, and probably the bigger, biggest reason that we're kind of working in this area is that the Fairmont line, which is a new transit line that runs from Reedville to downtown, has just opened most of its stations in the past couple of years. And what that means is if we develop near those stations, um, I think Mariella alluded to this, people will be able to actually cut down on vehicle um, miles traveled, be able to walk to the train station. There will be commercial development near that train station so they could get a cup of coffee. Right now, there's no coffee shop in Codman Square. Uh, there's no hardware store in Codman Square. So we need to begin, begin to create this framework and some of this development that we're doing will help create that framework. Um, what's interesting also about the TOD piece is that for people in this neighborhood, um, up until the train station opened, they could take a bus to get downtown. It would take an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes now they can get downtown in 20 minutes. And something like 40% of the people in this neighborhood actually uh, work downtown. So it's a huge, huge uh, win for the folks in this neighborhood. Um, the other two areas we're kind of focused on right now are local energy generation. And we work closely in concert with um, a guy named Travis Sheehan who works with John. He's the uh, other eco-innovation fellow. He's my doppelganger at the city. And he's focused on uh, energy. And so we're trying to figure out how do we um, generate energy in this neighborhood in a way that keeps the lights on if the grid goes down in a big storm. Now everyone knows that 100-year storms are now happening every you know, five years. And so how do we keep the lights on and generate energy in this neighborhood in a way that serves the neighborhood and keeps the lights on there? Um, and last but not least, the other piece we're, lens we're looking at things through is called green infrastructure. It's kind of the visible quality of life um, things that you can do in a neighborhood that make it more sustainable. So rain gardens, street trees, bike lanes, signage. How do you know that you have arrived at this new eco-innovation district? It's, those are kind of the visible ways you can show that you're there while also serving the environment. Um, 
and I think both Marielle and John alluded to this, the, the big question, the kind of big elephant in the room with all this is, how do you deal with equity? Because as you begin to create new attractive spaces um, for people, who gets to stay and who has to go? And so how do you maintain, you know, maintain a neighborhood for folks who have lived there for a long time and want to stay and make it affordable for them? So that's, and that's, no one's really figured that one out. We're trying to do it here in concert with everybody at the table and others, but how do we deal with the equity question is a huge issue. So we've been doing a lot of research into that as well. So with that, I'll stop and Joan will ask us some questions. Great. We started with Mariella saying that the foundation felt some sense of urgency about moving on climate and wanting to push and make it happen more quickly. And we hear John saying, well, we have to scale up. And I think this is one of the most important things in looking at that interaction of how big do you start? So when you describe the lead legislation, I would, it's certainly not cutting edge now. But for you 10 years ago to put this into place, all buildings have to meet lead standards, all buildings 50,000 square feet, right? That's what percent of all new buildings, you know, in a city? It's, it's not a big percentage. And it's new buildings, it's not existing buildings. So my point is not that, it wasn't, that this wasn't innovative. It was at the time, but it's really little impact. And so I think it's really important to talk about right from the get-go in implementing this, the city was looking, okay, we know we need to scale this up. How do we scale it up? And so this process of kind of push and thinking big really, really worked. Um, the other thing of this that really strikes me is the, the eco district and the innovation district did not start out as an eco district. It started out as a big part of the city's economic development strategy. This is how we're going to keep young people. We're going to create this space where innovation occurs. And the city was also, you know, concerned about development in the neighborhood. So my first question goes to John, and it's how did you decide that this large area that was an economic development strategy would be a good place to do an eco district and how did the city think about all right our first neighborhood level eco district is going to be where it is oh sure that's a great question um the the synergies of uh issues so climate change sea level rise but also literally what we've been baking into the uh, eco district, uh, or excuse me, the innovation district, the words are going to be so confusing this morning, um, in the seaport innovation district was, was really an economy and a place that was very uh, dynamic, very inventing of itself, a lab, an urban lab for uh, economic innovation. And the idea of an eco district, literally a place working on a district scale together to find new opportunities including addressing climate change, it, it's a very, you know, glove in hand fit. The fact is we face our greatest vulnerabilities in the city in the coastal areas, in the seaport area. This, if you look at an old map of Boston, you'll, you'll quickly realize is tidal flats filled, tidal flats. And most of this area is, is pretty low to the sea. The uh, FEMA expansion of the flood maps is going to significantly increase the area of the innovation district that's in the 100-year floodplain. So we have very, very real challenges. But we also know cities in particular and in places where there is significant infrastructure investment, these are our best practice spaces. These are the spaces where collectively we are the most efficient in our built form. So we've got a, a, a dual thing happening here. We've got remarkable vulnerability and historic investment in these areas, unprecedented levels of investment. And um, there's a neat saying in the green building world now that the greenest building is the one that already exists. So we should be working with our existing buildings. In a way, we should be working with our uh, existing cities. So um, frankly, I'm very optimistic about what we can do. But here, it's, it's about working together. So it's not going to be uh, a moment where uh, you know, there's a new 
big dig called the big barrier, the harbor that's going to save everyone from sea level rise. I don't think that's on deck. I think what we're going to be seeing here is many solutions being deployed over time, but we're also going to be seeing new partnerships, and some of those are going to be, uh, you know, between the city and private entities, but maybe some are going to be between the city and uh, district leadership. And some of it might be with um, our partners in the foundations who help us think uh, anew, who help us see practices that might not be available to us. Maybe it's in Copenhagen, or maybe it's um, cultivating some research right here that helps us with solutions right here. Okay. Um, a real leader in, in the environmental movement in the United States as it affects low-income communities was Van Jones. And Van Jones made the comment that um, people in low-income areas really aren't interested in climate change. Um, and what you need to do is make a direct connection to jobs. Now, Dave, you seem to be suggesting that people in the neighborhood you're working in kind of get it on climate change. Is that something you did through organizing? So how did you approach the people in the neighborhood to say, doing this eco-district thing is really something that would be important to your day-to-day -day lives? Um. Yeah, I mentioned the Millennium 10 process, which is a four-year process of planning. So we reached out to about a thousand people, and I think um, the notion of sustainability kind of bubbled up organically from those conversations when people started really understanding what sustainability meant. You know, it started with open space, and then we started talking about uh, green infrastructure and rainwater and 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 solar power and saving energy. And I think once people began to kind of get their heads around all of those things, they said, this is really as important to us as housing, as jobs, as anything else. Um, <clears throat> I'd say in the process of our conversation, you mentioned green jobs, green jobs have kind of started coming back up again. And while um, that wasn't necessarily our original mission to do that work, I think I've decided that it's really important for us to figure out how we can coalesce different partners around that too and start to figure out a way to get young people involved in green jobs or, and there's some folks in the neighborhoods who have already been doing this work for a long time. Um, and so we're partnering with them and trying to figure out how we can kind of, all ships rise with the tide, so how do we do that? Right. Mariella, for a foundation person wanting to advance the agenda of eco-districts, you started out by paying for a couple people from the city to go to a conference. And then it seems like the next step was to fund these fellows. How did you arrive at the fellows and how are you gauging success and whether you want to continue to invest in, say, helping Boston develop more eco-districts? What, what will define success for you and how will you move this agenda forward as a funder? Yeah. So the, the whole notion of supporting the Eco District Fellows was um, came out of me um, again pushing the city to think more more systematically and more in, you know thinking about innovation the next um, set of innovations that they need to engage in from the policy perspective. Um, I w I visited Copenhagen and was very impressed with what they have managed to accomplish over the many decades. And also, they put in place uh, a plan to make Copenhagen carbon neutral by 2025. Uh, already, 30% of their electricity is uh, uh, by wind, wind energy, is fueled by wind energy. Um, and they also have a district heating system. Almost all the buildings in Copenhagen have a district heating system, which is 70 to 80% more efficient than the individual furnaces that you have in your own buildings right now. So this is the way that they will be able to reach carbon neutrality um, by 2025. So I came away from that thinking, why isn't Boston like Copenhagen? Um, it feels very similar. It's almost the same size. We have, it has a beautiful waterfront. Um, it's uh, got vibrant neighborhoods. And when I came back and had a conversation with the folks at the city, um, I was thinking the innovation district is a lost opportunity. 
there was so much going on in terms of new development coming online, uh, being proposed, and there was no, um, there didn't seem to be a conversation about how can we not go about building buildings the same way. Yes, there were some LEED certified buildings coming online, but all these new systems were get, being put in place in individual buildings. So we were not going to achieve the 70 to 80 percent efficiencies that we saw in Copenhagen. This is technology that exists right now. And that conversation was not happening. Um, so for me, um, the investment that we have made in Travis Sheehan at BRA, the fellow, uh, in Dave, uh, at, at the enable level, is to build capacity both in the city as well as in the neighborhoods, um, these very talented people who can help drive these new innovations in the community. So what success will look like is, number one, if we have in a few years um, projects in place where we have a new way of um, you know, generating electricity, generating our heating systems, um, we have broad stakeholder engagement and conversation about a new way of doing business um, and a new way of how we're taking action on climate change and how we are embracing sustainability. Um, and also new practices and policies both at the neighborhood level and at the city where now we have institutionalized all these new practices. So for at the Cotman Square level, Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation is a community development corporation. It builds a lot of affordable housing in the community, uh, helps uh, retail uh, uh, stores um, come online. Um, all these are new developments. They could institutionalize very innovative um, green building sustainability guidelines when they build new construction mm -hmm. or when they retrofit new uh, old buildings what can they do to make them as efficient and sustainable and low carbon as possible? So that's, that's what success will look like to me. Okay. I have several more questions, but I think I'll let the audience have a go at the, the speakers as well. Questions? Catherine. Questions for David. Um, you mentioned green jobs, and I'm wondering, oh, thank you. You mentioned green jobs, and I'm wondering um, where they're coming from. What is the economic uh, what, what is the economic shift that's accounting for them? You know, I, I don't know if there's been a big shift. I think we're we're basically trying to create uh, the circumstances for those jobs to to appear in a way. So one of the things that's happening in the eco innovation district is that we have an area, we, we call it the auto mall, because right now, there are something like nine auto-related businesses in Convin Square in, in this capture area. Um, there's a section of New England Ave we call the auto mall that eventually will be developed. One of the neighbors has actually proposed that we create some sort of auto-related business to teach young people how to work on a Prius, for example, and take advantage of the new technology that's out there and, and learn how to do that. Um, we also are looking at food-related um, businesses in this area. Um, we're also looking at how we can, and these aren't necessarily green jobs, but looking at how we could create back office support for minority contractors. So trying to fill those needs. But you know, Mariella was right. One, one of the things we're trying to do is build anything we do to a much higher standard. So right now, um, we've got a... <clears throat> new, uh, some houses that will probably come online in about four year, three to four years. Uh, they're known as the church lots because they're owned by a local church. What I've been pushing for internally is for those uh, buildings to be built to a HERS standard of 50 or better. So the HERS rating system um, is the home energy rating system, and zero is like a zero energy building like the ones John was talking about, 100's kind of average. So we're actually trying to basically look at a standard of 50 or better now for anything we do from now on that we build new. We haven't really addressed the retrofits yet, but um, we think that there will be green jobs affiliated with that. Uh, we're talking to different providers in the neighborhood um, around <clears throat> solar energy, for example. So one of the things we want to do is 
how do we do community, can we do a community shared solar project, which would be not just our buildings, it would be residential buildings, it would be uh, commercial buildings. What are the green jobs affiliated with those companies that are gonna put in those solar panels, for example? So we're beginning the conversation. I don't have a clear answer for you yet, but it's, we've started to have the conversation. Uh, could you, uh, uh, your first thank you for the... Uh, now everybody can sort of hear me better. Uh, your first, just thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, just great. Um, and these um, Echo District fellows seems like a, a really great way to do that. Could you just sort of give a summary job description that's in your mind of, okay, what... I mean, it's just such a great idea. And if you could summarize sort of... What, what's the purpose, what's the job description of those people? Well done, Mary, I'll cover my ears. Well, actually, um, my, my style was to plant the seed in these organizations, but they wrote the job descriptions. So I couldn't even tell you what was in them. <laughs> what, what, you, what was your challenge to them? What was the challenge for them? Yes. Um, so for Codman, um, they had um, come out of this community process where sustainability and the lead ND um, designation was a goal. Um, and uh, and they, had, they, came, they approached me and said, could you help us uh, with the lead ND process and designation, the project itself? And <laughs> my, my response was actually, Lead and D is so last century. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and I said, well, I, it's, it's not interesting to me, um, but what I would really like to see is that if you could take it many, many steps further, t push the envelope on the areas that are, re are really going to matter in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's on efficiency, and it's on local renewable energy generation. I wanted to see the carbon reductions. So the Power Foundation is unabashedly laser focused on reducing carbon emissions. We are unabashedly that, you know, focused on that. So that's what I said to them. Show me, show me that you can reduce carbon emissions, and I will support you. And, um, if, you know, and I think if you hire someone who can help you do that, that'd be great. But um, so that, that was the way that, that conversation went. And they actually said, you know what? Energy efficiency is a priority. Plus, it's going to put money back in the pockets of the people in the community. Yeah. It's going to have immediate impact. Um, so, it, you know, it's a win-win. Uh, for the BRA, it was, um, it was actually a great... Um, cost share. Uh, my challenge to them was, you know what, it would be great if you could have capacity in your office uh, around looking at the opportunities in the Innovation District and across the city for ways to um, look at generating um, energy efficiency, or looking for energy efficiencies as well as generating renewable energy or combined heat and power systems in a way that it will take us up a notch and get, again, in terms of our carbon reductions. Um, and I said, would you be interested if we uh, paid half the salary of a fellow? Uh, and actually, they, and they were very responsive to that and said, yes, we will ask our board for the 50% if you put in the 50%. So that's how that came about. Let me just add to that. Do you, go ahead, Mano. I was just going to add, I, I actually was the one who got to write the, uh, the job <laughs> description, so, um, but uh, we, we actually, I think what we have to recognize in this moment especially is, is the energy plan and capacity typically is not held by a municipality or even, frankly, at the state level, which is probably the only, uh, you know, governmental uh, uh, regulatory entity. It's, it's done by the utilities. So it's done by the local provider. Um, at a regional level, it's the ISO New England, which you know, deals with things on a much more uh, macro scale. But 
for us to begin to look and work in this space, it really took a focus on energy. So um, our, our eco district fellow is really one where we do expect some uh, uh, work in the eco district space, but a lot of the expertise we were looking for and, and is frankly still hard to find out there is around energy and energy practices. Um, I think it's also a really neat moment out there and um, uh, when we're done, I'm going to whisper to Dave that 50% on the HERS rating isn't, uh, it's so yesterday. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm going to push back on Mariella um, for ND because, uh, well, first of all, I'm one of the authors of the ND rating system, so uh, not quite yesterday yet. But uh, uh, it, we, we have really good building solution uh, scales, uh, excuse me, building scale solutions to our carbon challenges. And so, you know, picture a neighborhood like TNT with lots of energy positive homes, feeding the grid during the day. A lot of that power is going to go downtown to where people are working and into shared transportation, i.e. public transportation, and, and it's going to really have a meaningful impact on our energy profile, which right now still is principally a daytime load. So, you know, our, our energy use goes up, it's cyclical. We, we do our most harm to the environment during the day at those peak times. At nighttime, we're using our cleanest, most efficient uh, generation plants, and, and so we have a, a lower carbon footprint. So the opportunity of greening our neighborhoods with energy positive homes that really contribute in an aggregate way, a really significant way to the, to the community, citywide, or even region-wide power needs is going to be uh, remarkable. And so when we think about distributed energy, um, especially in an area like TNT, I see us moving toward a, a, an electric-based society. We're not going to run distributed thermal energy in a neighborhood like TNT. And in fact, thermal energy loads are, are almost, uh, you know, they're so minuscule right now in our, our new energy positive buildings. Uh, you know, a hair dryer will keep your house warm in the winter and, uh, you know, a bowl of ice is, is all you're going to need in the, in the peak of the summer. And I, I kid a little bit, but it's actually getting toward that. So we have really, really good solutions on, on thermal energy uh, that we can manage by conservation on a residential scale. So um, imagine neighborhoods where, there, where there's lots of electricity coming out of them during the day, a smart grid that's able to manage all these generation sources that are cyclical, and cyclical in subtle ways too. Cloud goes by the neighborhood and your PV power goes down. It's, it's a balancing act, but it's one I think technology will, is ready to solve for us. Um, downtown in the Innovation District, it is a much bigger scale and there are many more opportunities around resiliency, uh, cost efficiency, which also equates to carbon efficiency. And we can really do some heavy duty lifting on carbon reduction through distributed energies down, uh, down in our, our eco district downtown. So I think we're going to have a, a really interesting story there, but ND is going to be uh, a very good tool for us. ND gives lead, in, lead for neighborhood development gives us indices, measurements, matrices to evaluate a proponent's project against. Is it does it really have a, a good um, transportation footprint? Is the building as efficient as it can be? Is it employing distributed energy strategies? Is it resilient? And and so having some of these other tools in this space is actually going to be critical. Um, Lead ND is, is very much a, a version one green building rating system. So if you go back 10 years to when the first lead for new construction came out, it was, you know, pretty weak. And yet the market had an incredibly difficult time adapting to it. So it, it probably had the, you know, the pain productive ratio just right. And I think ND is actually in that space. It's mm -hmm. actually hard. Not everyone's picking it up. Not everyone's able to. It's not applicable everywhere because, interestingly enough, it discourages development in the wrong place. So there are entities who want to be green, but they're going to always have a lousy transportation footprint. And at the end of the day, we, we actually have a system that helps us guide, uh, uh, guide practices um, internationally. So it, it's, I, I think it'll, it'll remain a very relevant tool and it'll get updated from yesterday till tomorrow. Well, you, you know, um, and I don't want to get between the two of you on this lead ND thing, but um, 
one of the things my project, and John and I have talked about this a little bit, one of the things my project points to is maybe the need for a, a maybe a lead ND you know, 2.0, which would be something like lead for existing neighborhoods. Because like I said, we've kind of morphed the way we used it um, to fit our project, but it's not designed for that. And so down the road, you know, hopefully USGBC will think about doing something for existing neighborhoods that's similar. In the works. Right. <laughs> Uh, I, I also don't want to weigh in on that. We'll take that lead ND discussion offline. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to point out that it, your question about the fellows, um, there are different ways foundations can catalyze. And it's, and it's interesting for me, for example, the Rockefeller Foundation has this huge initiative on resilience in cities. And what they've done is, I think 100, 125 cities they've put resiliency officers at the city level. And these hadn't existed before, and so as you can imagine, there's a little trouble integrating them in and figuring out what they do, how does it interact with sustainability. And this is a different approach with the fellows. And um, if we're going to promote eco-districts or carbon reduction, the question is to the city, how can we help you do that? And putting these fellows in place is, as you've described the whole thing, a much more organic way of, of going ab about it. And time will tell you know, which of those ways is more effective. And maybe they're both effective in their own ways, but two different types of strategies for a um, foundation to really promote climate change. OK, we have time for one more quick question. Hello. Um, Stefana Stokes from Access Strategies Fund. And I really, really enjoy um, this session, and I want to bring it back to um, this theme around know your place and unleashing the power of local philanthropy. And we in this room and in this space, we have the luxury and um, benefit of being able to study the data to understand um, the building of communities and how um, community input is valuable. And so. As I sat here, I thought about, um, with that privilege in this philanthropic sector, how do we, um, how are we able to use spaces such as this to diversify the learning as we have um, policy makers, practitioners, um, and people in the public sector in the space? Because when we go outside in the community on the grassroots level, um, you know, there's not that love of the Boston Redevelopment Authority <laughs> from the community standpoint in, in the sense that there, there's a lot of skepticism in a lot of the neighborhoods that are being redeveloped uh, as, you know, many people have been realistically forced out of where they live in, that, in those neighborhoods that they built. And so that really is my question about how do we uh, use these spaces or promote more education so that skepticism, the fear of losing um, their, the neighborhoods that people live in, how do we use this space more effectively so that we have more people on the ground that don't have the privilege of understanding this, this kind of conversation and, and the issues involved? I, I think there's uh, one thing that's very uh, uh, present here is partnership. And we, and, and my work, I, I've spent most of my professional career working in our, our neighborhoods, um, planning, developing, and, and seeing projects of all manner come into fruition. Um, where we've done our most remarkable work is, is not where we've done it with community input, but where we've done it together. Um, one of my favorite models is the Boston Main Street program, which was a dramatic shift uh, in city government to partner with local groups. They became their own 501c3s. The city was a provider of resources, and the local Main Street groups were the, the instigators. They got the businesses to do things. They did their own things, everything from events to, to cleanups to storefront uh, renovations to branding and marketing and all manner of things like that. Um, and so I think it is in partnership, and that's, that's going to be the thing to watch. And it brings 
Mary Ellen and I together to do the, the things that we've done, the remarkable things that we've done, which, um, Joan, the, the, the thing that's neat about this is, is in this green building practice where we've seen the most happen is at the municipal scale. The, the ability of cities to change regulations, to change minds, to transform practices, the nimbleness that you have even at a large city like Boston or New York is remarkable compared to a state level or the federal level or even the, you know, the international level. Not that they're unimportant, they are, they're very important, but the, the, the on the ground change that Mariella can instigate with some strategic help that partnering with Dave and the Community Development Corporation in Codman Square and the community out there, the things that we can do in partnership are, are truly, truly remarkable. I do want to say we, and, and especially the BRA, are very, very attuned to the issues of, of displacement and gentrification. And it's a vexing issue, I think, for all of us. And it, it doesn't matter if you're in the profession of planning or architecture or community organizing. We have, on so many levels, strived to make places better, succeeded, and then realized we lost, in some cases, the very character that we were trying to cultivate and the people who were out there in the, in the tough days championing for the kind of change. And it's, it's a very vexing issue. I think we, we have come to a, an important realization as of late that we need to change and broaden our approach. It's not to change. We've actually had really good strategies in place. When we do new development, it's extremely inclusive. It's, it's some of the best inclusive policies in the country, yet it's, it's not that project that we lose the ground on. It's the house next door that sells because it's now next to something. And it doesn't sell to someone in the neighborhood, it sells to someone else. And we, we weren't working in that space and we lost ground there, but then we lose ground all over the neighborhood and in 10 years time we see places change from diverse affordable neighborhoods to places that are unaffordable and and so I, I think we're very keen to solving that and and we'll make some real progress in the coming months I think and years there have been many conversations I think the last time I was in here we were talking about strategies to address social equity to make sure that boats rise with the tide um, in the Dorchester neighborhood where we're planning around the Fairmont line, as Dave mentioned, our, our strategy, funny enough, is, is called gentrification from within. You know, how do we assure that, that people have an opportunity to really rise with the change? And it's, it's hard, hard work. Our, our macro economy, it's not friendly to this. It's, it's a competitive space. And so we, we, we actually have to, I think, broaden our minds and have a lot more conversations with partners about how we can how we can work effectively in here but the the intent is there and and i think we're going to get someplace pretty remarkable in the next few months in the next few years okay i'm afraid we've run out of time and we don't want to be between our audience and their lunch so thank you panel this was a very interesting discussion